Welcome to Sardar TV. I'm Vaishali Jain. We're excited to have Irene Chang Britt join us today. Irene is an independent board director for several organizations, including Terravia, Taylor Brands, and Duncan Brands. Prior to this, she was chief strategy officer for the Campbell Soup Company, and today she's here to tell us more about her role as a board director. Irene, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Okay, start off by telling us about the boards you serve on and your role. Well, I serve on three boards right now, all of them public. Uh, one is Dunkin' Brands, which is Dunkin' Donuts and Baskin Robbins. Um, another is Tailored Brands, uh, which is a combination of Men's Warehouse and Joseph A. Bank. Um, another one is a very cool microalgae-based um, protein scale-up um, out of um, Silicon Valley, which is called Terravia. And prior to this, I had served on the board of Sunoco. Mm -hmm. And what is your role on these boards? Well, I'm an independent board director, like my peers, like most of my peers. Some are not independent. Um, and each of us on a board also serves on a committee or two. And so I tend to serve on audit committees because I have financial expertise. Um, I also serve on compensation committees. And I also serve on nomination and corporate governance committees. In fact, I'm the chair of one of the nomination and corporate governance um, committees on one of my boards. How do you define a director's role on a board? In essence, a director is appointed by the shareholders um, to take care of their interests on a financial basis. And so that is everything from short term, how is the stock performing? All the way to stewardship of the company over the long run to be a good performing and a competitively advantage performing company over the long term. So you really are the steward of the enterprise over the long term, hand in hand with the CEO and management team. And so when you have that breadth of responsibility in the shareholders' interests, your role is really about um, value creation, both short term and long term. What are some of the things you thought about prior to joining the boards that you're on now? Well, it was really interesting because um, my joining a board was not only my own interest, but at the time I was a C-suite executive in Fortune 500, and my CEO said, you know, we'd really like you to go join an outside board. It's not only good for um, you, for your own development as you've risen to these ranks, but also it's good for us in that if an executive who knows how to run businesses within a company, in addition adds corporate board service to their experience, they become a much better executive because they understand their own company better and their own board better, who they have to present to all the time, if they're on a board at another company. And so there's a very symbiotic relationship and that was some of the best advice that I had gotten. Mm -hmm. So I went on my first board um, while I was still an executive, went on my second board um, successively. Uh, usually most large companies will only allow their executives to go on one board at a time because of course they have a day job. <laughs> and then uh, when that company was sold, I went on to another board. So CFOs list two reasons that boards fail and that's lack of honesty and undisclosed self-interest. Do you agree with this? That's very negative and nefarious of them to think that way. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know of any board members that actually get up in the morning and say, aha, I'm going to be sneaky and nefarious and dishonest. Um, most board members are actually extraordinarily honest and earnest about what they do. In my experience, boards that fail lack skill rather than honesty. And the skill set needed in a boardroom changes as competition changes, as the consumer changes, as you know the outside world regulations change. There is a constant need to upgrade the skills and change the skills on a board. Um, and that is our obligation to do that. I would say that skill set gaps are probably where boards fail more often versus, you know, intended dishonesty. What would you say are some of the biggest changes that boards have undergone in recent times? 
Well, you know, prior to the big named issues like the Enrons of the world, um, I wasn't a board member before that time, but here's how we hear it from people who were in this space. They talk about the fact that, you know, boards tended to be more so who, who the CEO knew and who the chairperson knew. And they could have had skills in that uh, area in the company's interest, most of the time not. Um, boards tended to be more yes people to the CEO and rubber stamped. After the big tumult with the dishonesty of some um, boards uh, or turning a blind eye, the entire board industry, I would say, changed and realized we can't do this old boys club anymore. We can't keep on doing this just have um, from a governance standpoint to check the box that we have a board of directors. We actually need boards to roll up their sleeves and steward the company with the CEO. And so that sea change was about getting the right skills and experience in the boardroom to actually help the CEO and the management team versus rubber stamp. What are some financial and non-financial indicators of organizational performance? Well, the financial ones are, are very simple. You know, um, at the very top end, it's about um, creating shareholder value, which is usually compar comparable uh, total shareholder returns on the stock market. Now I'm talking about public boards here. Private is very different. That's driven by the key indicators on the profit and loss statement. So earnings per share, backing that up to earnings before interest and taxes. So, you know, operating earnings, um, margin makes uh, a big contribution to that, obviously, and net sales. And so those are all variables to determine earnings per share that, that then leads to um, how it performs on the stock market. Uh, on the balance sheet, you know, so level of debt, price earnings ratio, um, debt to equity ratio, return on invested capital, all of those things. When you go to the non-financial side then, it is about strategic direction. And that's more so than any other determinant of the long-term health of the company. And obviously those are not things that get written in stone and stay, stays the same forever. The non-financial indicators are determined by a well thought out and a well debated strategic plan starting with your very end consumer, whether it's a consumer who walks down the street or a business, if you happen to be business to business, starting with their concerns, where are they now, how are they feeling, where are they going, what are their needs evolving to, and then backing that all the way into a strategic plan. Can you outline a director's role in evaluating financial statements? The board is obviously fiscally responsible along with the CEO in general, but really the evaluation um, lies most f in the most focused way with the audit committee and or the finance committee. More often there's an audit committee, there's always an audit committee, there doesn't always have to be a finance committee. But in general, the deep dive into the P&L and the balance sheet, the quarterly earnings, the annual earnings report out to uh, the street and investors is done by the audit committee at a very, very deep dive level. Um, the overall board has a responsibility to keep track um, in by management report at the meetings, however often they are, four to six times a year, of how uh, the company is doing. And that tends to be a full board role. What are some of the most financial skills and experiences that a board member should have? Well, so a board member should be fairly agile around both a P&L and a balance sheet. Um, and not only that, but also have some knowledge of financial instruments, you know, whether it is debt or equity financing, knowledge enough around those areas. That is the reason why, and you know, people ask me all the time, you know, how do you get on a board and what skills do you need? And boards still look for people who have run businesses. So very top level, it's about sitting or retired CEO. If not sitting or retired CEO, then sitting or retired president, divisional president, 
and or CFO, because those are people who not only have, to your point, the financial skills, the acumen to look at a P&L and balance sheet and have good judgment, but also who have sat at the level of a person who has run a business and understand the huge number of variables that go into running a business that result in financial results. What is the director's role in meeting compliance obligations for the well, organization? Compliance is a huge topic these days. Enterprise risk management is one of the most topical um, areas of con concern now. Um, part of that is around compliance. It's, that's huge because we are all uh, responsible to the SEC for making sure that from a financial reporting standpoint that the company is um, holding not only to the letter of the law but the spirit of the law. But then it encompasses a lot more. That is not always regulated but you know there is cybersecurity issues these days. There's enterprise risk management from the perspective of did you see around the corner and uh, on competitors and where they were going and did you manage the risk of the company, which is a huge topic in proxy statements. Um, we detail that out to give our investors a good level of comfort of how we're looking at enterprise risk. From compliance to broad enterprise risk management, that is one of the primary roles of a board. And how is risk and strategy interrelated? Can you give us a, the perspective of a board member? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of people think about risk only as the bad things that might happen to you and how do you negate them. But really when you think about risk, risk can build strategy because risk can also show you opportunity. What's coming down the road at you that might be a threat that might be turned into an opportunity or what might be a threat to a competitor that might be an opportunity for you. And so starting your look at broad strategy at, by taking a look at some of the larger risks that are out on, on the horizon is actually very fundamental. What would you say out of all these things? I mean, everything is a challenge and there's a lot to be uh, looked at from a, a board member's perspective. Can you talk about some of the challenges in those areas, be it audit, be it finance, be it risk compliance? What are some of the challenges that boards are facing today in these areas? Well, I think um, cybersecurity is a huge challenge that boards are facing. And um, the interesting thing about that is um, there are not a lot of board members who are cyber experts and everything changes and hackers get smarter every single day um, and nation states get smarter and a little bit more unpredictable every single day. So on a topic like cyber, not many board members are going to be cyber experts, but if you have read enough, you know what questions to ask the experts in the company. And that's really the role of board is about governance, right? You're not there to manage, you're not there to be the expert in each of the areas, but you know have to know how to ask guiding questions. One of my favorite um, sayings on boards when people are moving from a management career into a board very often they want to go in and manage and that's not the role of a board and so I always say to them noses in fingers out mm -hmm. and it's a great guideline to be able to go in and say how do I look at these things so when you look at um, cyber that's a huge uh, uh, risk when you look at regulatory compliance and how the regulations are changing when you look at um, uh, where your consumer is going, consumers are changing very quickly. The millennial population is setting new standards for what they're looking for every single day. When you um, also look at um, disruption, that is one of the biggest risks that, to your point, can also be turned into opportunity um, that is out there. So. There are venerable companies out there, huge, long-lasting companies, who also don't think every day like the startup entrepreneurs. And so from a risk standpoint, that is something that boards have to be looking around the corner to see what new business model out there is about to be invented or being invented that might threaten us. When does the board assess whether there needs to be another type of board member. 
So if the board is well run, and this is especially falls um, in the lap of the chair of nomination and corporate governance, um, there should be extraordinarily robust uh, performance reviews of the board, of the full board and individual members of the board and individual committees every single year. So once a year, you take a look at that. If you do it right, at the same time that you're looking at performance, then you also look at skill gap. And many boards have um, what we call a skill matrix. And you have your board members, and you have the skills that you need according to the strategy that you have. And you have to redo that once in a while when you redo strategy. And you find out where the gaps are. And then take a look at that and say, OK, do we need um, to refresh our board? Do we need to turn over some of our board to be able to get some of those gaps that we don't have? Now, I will say that it's a hard discipline. How do you fire a colleague? right? And very often, all of the members of the board are good contributing members, but if you have to make room, you have to figure out how do you turn over. Now, there are some mechanisms to turn over board members. There's age limits and term limits, although those are very long, right? Um, and then there is also, there are um, natural uh, governance guidelines. Many boards actually have a rule that if a board member changes their day job, they get another job or they get, they leave their company or whatever, they actually have to resign and then the board can either accept or, or reject that resignation. That There's opportunities to create movement, um, but they're fewer and farther between. Board members have also uh, are responsible for managing risk, but some have expressed concern that too much governance stifles growth. How do you balance that, and what are your thoughts? Issue of too much governance stifling growth is very interesting to me because I haven't seen that. Too much management from a board stifles growth. <laughs> um, if you are governing well, you're asking the right questions. And if you're asking the right questions, you should be asking strategic questions about innovation as well. What, how is it being done, how fast? One of the issues that um, boards and companies um, get tied up in is when the board dives into, fingers in, management asking so many details and opining on so many details that it does stifle. Um, but if boards lift themselves up to the appropriate strategic level, I don't think that should ever stifle growth. There was a study that was done that showed that 60% of boards felt like they were facing a greater volume and type of complexity today than they, have, they were five years ago. And while certain types of organizations are required by law to have a separate risk committee, how effective is it have to have a separate committee managing risk? I think it depends on what industry you're in. So if you're talking about broad strategic risk because changes in consumer trends, changes in um, uh, competitive landscape, things like that, I'm not so sure you necessarily need a risk committee. For more compliance-oriented risk and financial reporting risk, the audit committee often deals with that. For cybersecurity, depending on your industry, if you have things that can be handled by the audit committee, cyber risk can actually fall into that. If you are a defense contractor, you better have a separate risk committee for that, right? You better even have a very specialized cybersecurity committee. So it really depends on your industry and your level of risk, and that is always decisionable. Um, boards can choose to break off into another committee, combine certain committees, except for the basic three, but those things are um, fungible over time. Does organizational culture have an impact on risk ap appetite and tolerance? Yes, organizational culture certainly does. Um, the tone is set at the top. Um, it's set at the top with the CEO. It is also set at the top with the board. Um, and the questions that a board will ask about risk sets the risk culture a lot. The amount of time and energy spent on risk by the CEO with the board will also set the tone for the rest of the organization. 
the bulk of the organization doesn't see the board on a regular basis, right? So the C-suite will present, and once in a while other things will ha other meetings will include various levels, but not so often. And so it really is the feedback from the board after a board meeting that the CEO then and his C-suite, his or her C-suite cascades down, is really what interacts with that organizational culture that you talk about. What would you say are some of the factors that determine the risk appetite of a board then? You know, risk appetite of a board is determined very much uh, by the evolution of the company. You know, is it a long-term blue chip cash rich business model? Is it something that might be disrupted in a second, um, like Uber disrupted the taxi industry, right? Is it a company that has always relied on innovation and therefore um, that is the lifeblood of the company, that, that will have a higher risk tolerance. I find the more long-term cash flow rich companies tend to be more risk averse. They don't want to disturb that. That's what their share price is based on. In this age of disruption, that can be a very dangerous mentality to have. So it's been common practice by public companies to have risk oversight handled by the audit committee. Yes. Right? What are some of the pros and cons of this? Audit committee members are usually very financially savvy. That's why they're on there. So there's CFOs and CPAs and uh, people who have run companies or divisions. So that profile of executive has a good viewpoint of risk. They've handled a lot of risk in their executive lives. Um, so it's an appropriate place. It's also a place where you deep dive into the financials um, of a company. It is appropriate to that extent. Now, again, as we said, if you are in defense contracting, if you are making fighter jets, you possibly don't have enough skill on the just the audit committee to handle risk, and you probably don't have enough time on the agenda, actually, in an audit committee meeting to handle that amount of risk. So at that point, it's very advisable to have a risk committee. So when I was in the energy industry, that had a lot of inherent risk from an infrastructure standpoint. We definitely had a risk committee in addition to the audit committee. Um, and that is always situationally appropriate. And I think every board has to think, you know, what is really appropriate for this board? Some boards have um, separate strategy committees. You know, there are some boards that have corporate responsibility committees. Really depends. The number of committees and the types of committees really, just like the skills of the portfolio of board members, really should be determined by what does the company need as determined by the strategy. What are some issues that boards have when it comes to handling risk as it relates to business projections? I think the biggest issue facing both management teams and um, boards on risks is that risks disturb the normal course of business. And the biggest issue that I see is that boards and management teams like business as usual on any given day because that's known. And just like any other human beings, risk is, um, is uh, scary. The issue with seeing risk as a negative, though, is that things can come and disrupt your business if you don't pay attention to them. And so from a handling of risk standpoint, I always advocate that the board and senior management spend a good amount of time, as uncomfortable as it is, <laughs> spend a good amount of time on that fairly negative issue of what might go wrong, because that can lead to both defense, a good defense, but it can also lead to a really great offensive strategy as to how do you become agile to get around that and maybe find other sources of business. But it is against human nature to look at the negative. And that's why you have to be very, very disciplined as a board to really look at what are our weaknesses, where are we at risk, where are the holes in our strategy, where are, where are the holes in our defense mechanisms. 
you know, we've seen several organizations mired in scandal over the years, Enron and Volkswagen and Wells Fargo. Can you talk a little bit more about what happens when boards fail? Yeah, I think, especially in those cases, the board was not looking for the right things, not only not looking at the right things. It's a difficult situation when you're in the board room because you are the recipient of what management chooses to show you. And if management doesn't choose to show you the things that are a little squirrely, then you don't actually know because you don't live with that company every day. You live with that company four, maybe six times a year. So unless you get shown it proactively by management, or you know enough to ask what skeletons are hidden in the closet, you may not see some of those things. Is it a failure of oversight to not have seen it if management never shows you? If it's an obvious issue, then yes, it's a failure of oversight. If you never get to see it because you're blinded by it, by the management team, that's a really tough call. Now I have heard in a given situation that the customer service um, levels of dissatisfaction, so the customer dissatisfaction was actually very well known and it was in one of the reports that the board saw. So was that a failure of um, governance to not have asked about that issue? Absolutely. The reason why board directors should be seasoned executives is that you really have to be a bit of a detective. In the nicest, most supportive way ask some of the tougher questions, ask about things that are not going right, and coax that out. Because a management team, as honest as a management team can get, the board is still their boss. They still want to please their boss, like many people want to please their bosses. They are going to show all other things being equal, the positive side of things, right? That is human nature, that is organizational nature. So the board has an obligation to dig a little bit deeper and sometimes to ask the uncomfortable questions that management didn't think to show the answers to. Maybe let's be um, nice about it and not say, say that they were hiding anything, but at least they might not have thought of bringing up the negative. What should a board look for in executive reports? I think every, every company does executive reports differently. I mean, the, the from an audit committee standpoint, it's fairly standard, um, you know, to take a look at the, the quarterly earnings and the financial statements that support that. But from executive reports, the biggest thing for the board to be skilled at is understanding what drives financial success, both short term and long term in the company. And are those metrics being reported by the management team? And if there are metrics, um, or even softer, more qualitative variables that need to be looked at for the long-term success of a company, boards should be asking for those things. Tell us what role the board plays in overseeing business sustainability and oversight. So that's critical to the board role. If we're working for the shareholders over the long run and over the short run, but primarily over the long run, our role is stewardship of that company for the sustainable future. And that is really guided by how deeply does the board understand the strategy? Was it involved in the strategy? And that's a pretty controversial thing that I'll get back to. Um, and has really taken that strategy to task and really questioned it and tested it for its value in creating value over time. There's a lot of debate about a board's role in strategy and a lot of people say, well, that's management's role. But really, if you think about your role as company steward over time, you have to be involved in the strategy. You're not gonna do the strategy, but you have to be hand in hand with the company's management in understanding and questioning the aspects of the strategy that get built over time to make sure that it is, it is robust and tested. What are some common mistakes that board members make with capital and resource allocation? And how could this be avoided? 
I think fundamentally, if you don't have a strategy that is founded on the value of strategic initiatives that are the alternatives that can be looked at for the ultimate fulfillment of the vision, then you don't have a basis on which to understand the best use of capital in each of those strategic initiatives. So sometimes people think of strategy as very conceptual. Strategy actually isn't conceptual. Strategy is based on fundamental analysis of the company, how it is doing, what lines of business are doing well, doing poorly, what are the prospects for that line of business over time, and projecting that out and projecting the risk and return of strategic initiatives, even though those, those projections are not 100% perfect, at least they're directional, gives you a much better quantitative analysis on which to base decisions of capital allocation. Give us a breakdown of how you spend your time on various board activities. Well, the basic thing is when the board book gets, um, which is uh, often digital these days, we still call it a board book, gets sent out, the several hundred pages that it usually is, usually comprising an update on how the performance is going, an update on strategic initiatives, any myriad of issues that you have to deal with. It takes quite a bit of time to prepare. So if you're going to be a well-informed board member, ready at the moment to ask questions right in the meeting without flipping through pages, you will have studied that book for several days in advance of the board meeting. So that's a huge amount of time that is invested. At the board meeting itself, it usually is going through you know, each of those pieces, it depends. Um, committee meetings are usually two, three hours um, on, depending on, again, the depth of discussion on compensation or audit or whatever. So that takes a big chunk of the time as well. And very, very importantly, most boards have moved to executive sessions. Executive sessions with uh, the CFO. Audit committees often do that CFO without the CEO in the room to see if there's anything that needs to be said without the pressure of hierarchy, which is a very good practice. Um, many of my audit committees, actually, we meet with the internal um, auditor who actually reports right to the um, audit committee. We spend time in executive session with the CEO. We spend time then, at the end, best practice is to have the independent board directors only, i.e. not including the CEO in the room, um, or any um, non-independent chairs or vice chairs or whatever. Um, and the independent directors actually have their own executive session evaluating what they heard at the board meeting. So while the agenda can vary depending on what is topical at the time, besides performance, current performance of the company, hopefully at least an hour at the end of each meeting is spent evaluating what you just heard for those one to one and a half days. What are some things that you've done or that board members can do to sort of enhance their own skills as a board member, uh, specifically around finance and risk? Yes, I think that board members always have to keep current. Around finance and risk specifically, um, it is about reading, keeping on top of the current issues in risk management, mm -hmm. keeping on top of, from a finance perspective, it really is about how the company is doing. But there are much broader topics that board members have to stay relevant on. And so there are many organizations, I'm a little bit biased towards the National Association of Corporate Directors, but there are other organizations out there as well um, that uh, promote constant board learning and education. And so they will have very topical sessions on an ongoing basis. And you know, because board members, um, many of us, are, do not go to an office every day and we are not fully employed elsewhere, it really is our obligation to stay on top and relevant in service of the company that we serve on more than ever before. Can you tell us about some best practices to sort of maximize board effectiveness? 
I think one of the things to maximize board effectiveness is really um, managing performance and dynamics. Um, a board is a collection of peers. There really is not much hierarchy outside of, you know, there's a chair and it's still, unlike um, organizational hierarchy, it, it is a board of hopefully equivalently skilled peers, very skilled peers. And that dynamic is intricate to manage in that there's no one person telling other people what to do. It's not as simple as that anymore. It is about collaboration and challenge. And to balance those two things, to be a highly challenging board enough to get to some of the issues that the company really has to deal with, yet remain collaborative and able to come out the other side with good, positive action for the company is really quite an art. And so I would say managing the board dynamics is the most effective way of ensuring board effectiveness. How did your role as chief strategy officer with the Campbell Soup Companies help you in your role as a board member? That's a really interesting question. You know, so I have spent my entire career running businesses and um, that skill of running businesses, p &L, balance sheet, all functions, large organizations, dispersed labor force, all of that really, I thought, was the best training to be on a board because, you know, you see the full venue. And then when I became Chief Strategy Officer, I had to think enterprise-wide and global. And equally about all functions versus vertical business units. So while vertical business units are a good proxy for an entire company, really seeing across the company and dealing with the board of the company I was employed by was really icing on the cake in terms of honing my skills on a, as an executive. Can you tell us the process you actually had to go through to become a board member? Yes, it's a long <laughs> and sometimes hidden process to become a board member. So the first thing I tell people, and I mentor quite a few people to um, try to get on to boards, is that if you're a sitting executive, you want to make sure that your company, and especially your CEO, actually advocates for you being on a board. That is the good housekeeping seal of approval for an executive. If the CEO gets out into the marketplace and says, I love Vaishali, she's an amazing executive and you should have her on the board, that is just golden. It's also critical for executive search firms to know that because um, they want to know that your CEO will allow you to be on a board if they find a good opportunity for you. They don't want to do all that work without you being um, endorsed. So that's one thing. You have to be out there and network. Um, and it's not just networking in board settings. I actually met the CEO of the company that I first went on to the board of, Sunoco, which, 43, which was, we had sold it, um, later on, but um, a $43 billion company at Fortune Most Powerful Women. We were at the conference together. We got together, we talked about a couple things, we got to know each other, an opportunity came up and she thought, mm, I need your skills. So networking in professional circles, not just in board circles, really, really helps. Networking with the recruiters, the executive recruiters in the board space, so not the normal ones if you've always been dealing with people on the management side in your vertical of expertise. Those are not the same people who work on the board practice, and so you have to um, use your contacts to get to know those people. I can't say that there's any one route. It really is about managing that entire network and making sure that people understand that you're willing to serve, that you're available to serve, and that you have the skills to serve. Well, great, Irene. This was really good. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Yeah, it was and we'll see you next time on Sardar TV.